told me that he's, he might have to leave early to watch the Matildas. I didn't say <laughs> 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 My mum is going to leave to watch the Matildas. But I'm, I'm afraid to say I timed myself, and this is the, I've been waiting a long time to give this speech, so I'm, I'm trying to fit quite a few in. Um, first, I have a few um, thanks and acknowledgements. I'd like to thank the Bathurst District Historical Society for inviting me to give this talk. The president of the, the society, Mary Fletcher, she comes up. She's there. She's there. And before her, Samantha Friend, have given me generous access to the museum's archives and library. Likewise, members of the Bathurst Family History Group have given me unfailing research support and encouragement. I'd also like to thank Sarah Swift for creating the beautiful publicity material that has attracted you all to come here tonight. As you would know from her recently published book, 75 Treasures, which is over there for sale, Sarah is an excellent historian and a great asset to the society. <clears throat> My talk tonight about Bathurst Chinese market gardeners is about a group of people whose presence in Bathurst is not immediately visible in the landscape or in histories written about Bathurst. But there is a much older and deeper layer of history layer of history of this land, of the indigenous Wiradjuri people, the traditional custodians. I acknowledge that we are on Wiradjuri land and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any other indigenous people here tonight. I acknowledge that Aboriginal sovereignty was never ceded and I acknowledge that the Chinese people were amongst the colonists who took part in and benefited from the dispossessions of Aboriginal land. <coughs> So we're actually coming up to two events of national importance concerning our First Nations people. Firstly, the referendum. Constitutional recognition through a voice to parliament stems from the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is an invitation to all Australians to walk together towards a better future for all. I've accepted this invitation, and together with like-minded people, formed a group called Bathurst for Yes. I invite all of you to join us, and I've left some pam pamphlets over there. You can just Google Bathurst for Yes. <coughs> Secondly, next year will mark the bicentenary of the proclamation of martial law in Bathurst <clears throat> in 1824. Sorry. It is emotional, but I've, I've got a frog in my throat. <laughs> um, um, this bicentenary is another opportunity for us to listen, to acknowledge the losses that came with colonisation, and to facilitate the sharing of knowledge to bring our community together in greater understanding of our shared history. Okay, I'll get on with it. Oh, not that one. Would you like to watch again? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. research I'm presenting tonight comes from a PhD thesis. I was very fortunate to have received a scholarship to do a PhD at Charles Sturt University, and the doc uh, my doctorate was conferred in 2019. Um, this is the title of my thesis, which you can download from the Charles Sturt University Research Outlook. I owe a debt of gratitude uh, to the supervisors of my thesis, Dr. Ruth Backus and Professor Dominic O'Sullivan. I also had two other wonderful supervisors, in Dr. Margaret Van Hecker and Dr. Robin McLaughlin, OAM. <coughs> uh, I want to pay special respect to, to Rob McLaughlin. We all miss Rob, who died suddenly last October. As you know, Rob shared much of his time and knowledge with the Bath Bathurst District Historical Society. He and Joe made a great civic contribution through their volunteering with many, many community groups, such as St. Vincent de Paul, BMEC, the Bathurst Whole Food Co-op and Boundary Road Reserve Land Care Group. The Boundary Road group are planning a commemoration for Rob and Joe, probably October this year, so I'll make sure that information about that is passed on in case anybody wants to attend. So it was Rob who encouraged me to begin my research with a comprehensive trove search. I'm a bit worried that with the light off, people might fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bit too warm. You know, I like, feel like you're in bed. <laughs> I'll call you out if I see you asleep. <laughs> Um, so Rob regarded my research, my attitude to my research as being dogged. Um, he actually referred to me as a terrier, um, chasing a scent. I'm still chasing that scent. I'm learning more all the time, 
and I fully expect that when I speak to members of the audience after this talk, I'll have new leads. Um, so if you have information to share, come, please come and talk to me at the, end of my, at the end of this. And I'm also learning from descendants who have contacted me since my thesis was published. For anyone who's curious, I'm not a descendant. Um, well, I'm not a, a descendant of, of Bathurst Chinese. Um, I moved to Bathurst from Sydney with my family about 15 years ago, but I have made contact and friendships with descendants of Bathurst Chinese community who've gen generously shared their photos and their research on their family histories with me. Um, so this is a photo of, um, of Char Charlie and Lucy Onwan at White Rock. Um, and the photo was shared by their great-granddaughter Debbie Cannon-Clark, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Grafton earlier this year. The contact I've had with descendants, both online and in person, has truly been one of the most rewarding aspects of my research. I've not only been able to share what I've found, but their stories and photos have opened up a, great, a much greater understanding for me. And some of the descendants are here tonight. Can I, uh, would you mind standing up? Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, if you've already taken the time to read my thesis, you will, I'm sure, learn more tonight by hearing some of the family stories and the photos which I've, um, which I've, uh, I've uh, uh, received or been able to share since publishing my thesis. Um, and I also want to acknowledge. Um, the research of those who came before me, um, my colleagues in the field of Chinese Australian history, whose research I've benefited from deeply. My good friend, Dr. Barry McGowan, OAM, together with Genevieve Mott, wrote this report. You can read it, True Australians and Pioneers, A Thematic History of the Chinese in Orange, Cabon, and Blaine Shires. I think you can tell from the title how, how um, Barry and Genevieve felt um, about Chinese migrants to the Central West. And this is a book by Dr. Jo Joanna Boileau, which came with her PhD thesis on Chinese market gardeners in Australia and New Zealand. Joanna examined how Chinese gardeners adapted their skills to a new environment and how they made a significant contribution to the economies of Australia and New Zealand. So I'll take Joanna's work as a launching pad to pose some of the questions I'll try to answer in this talk. Why did these market gardeners establish themselves in, ba in, in Bathurst and District? <laughs> who were they and where were they from? What skills did they bring with them? And how did they adapt to new conditions? Where were these market gardens? How extensive were they and how long did they last? What were the challenges faced by the Chinese market gardens, gardeners and why was their history important? Okay, so to begin with, um, the majority of Chinese who came to Australia for the gold rushes came from the Pearl River Delta region. Um, so it's just near Hong Kong, just adjacent to Hong Kong. As the research of historian Dr. Michael Williams has shown, Chinese men who came to, to work in Australia generally did not intend to settle. They came to earn enough savings to return home to the village and buy land and build a home. Many left wives behind in their villages who they saw on visits back home when children were conceived. While some men returned to China, for others, life took different paths with some marrying and settling some dying in Australia. <clears throat> the Pearl River Delta, which you see in this map, is a fertile farming area of southern China. Between twice yearly crops of rice, vegetables, sorry, between twice yearly harvests of rice, vegetables and other crops, such as oranges, peanuts, and tobacco were grown. Most of the men who came from the Pearl River Delta had experience in growing vegetables. However, they had to adapt to different climates in Australia. In Bathurst, that meant much less rainfall than they were used to, droughts and frosts. They also had to adapt to growing different vegetables. <clears throat> One source for my thesis was the recollect recollections of Chinese market gardeners written by Walter Hunt of Penrose at White Rock. Does anybody remember Walter Hunt? Some of you might remember his wife, Nan Hunt. Um, Back in 1998, Bathurst Goldfields commissioned a firm to build a Chinese mining village at the Goldfields. The firm wrote a de development brief, and there's a copy of that brief in the, in the Bathurst District Historical Society Museum Library. Um, the brief includes an account of Chinese market gardens in Bathurst by Walter Hunt. It has the rather uncharitable title of The Chinese Invasion of Bathurst. Hunt wrote that when the goldfields around Bathurst ceased yielding payable gold, Chinese from the goldfields 
descended onto the alluvial flats around the district and began to grow vegetables for market. The method generally employed was for the Chinese to rent approximately eight to 10 acres of land from the landholder, rental being about six shillings per acre. The owner of the land would plough the area for approximately five shillings per acre. Then when the produce was ready for market, he would deliver it to the nearest railway station, station charging one shilling per tonne per mile. The carting, ploughing, etc., was done with horse teams. Um, he said this, con this suited both parties as most of the landholders did not have a clue about vegetable growing and anyway, it was beneath their dignity to garden. That sort of work was only fit for Chinamen. <clears throat> As you know, there were gold fields all around Bathurst, and there were large Chinese populations on the gold fields. In 1865, a gold field opened close to Bathurst. This was the Gladmire gold field, private gold field open to the public on payment of a license fee. This is a photo of um, the Gladmire gold field, which the late historian Judy Webb shared with me. Her husband, Peter Webb, found it when they bought Gladmire Hall. Um, in, in late 1865, it was reported that 390 mining licenses were taken out by Chinese people on the Gladmire Goldfield. Where there were large Chinese mining populations, there were also gardens to supply their vegetable needs, and this extended to providing the veg to um, providing for the vegetable needs of the Baptist population too. In 1865, the Gladmire Gold Oh, sorry, 1865, the year the Glanmire Goldfield opened, was the year in which I found the first report of Chinese market gardeners in Bathurst. There was an advertisement in the um, Government Gazette of an impoundment of <coughs> pony from the Chinese gardens on Morrisett Street. Um, okay, the 1867 post office directory listed Ah Fu and Ah San as gardeners of Morrisett Street. Uh, there was also Yan War Long, Chinese doctor, John Lu, farmer of Havana Street, and John Gu, hawker of Rankin Street. Beyond the municipality, the directory listed Ah Lin, market gardener at Lagoon. Market gardeners such as Ah Lin, whose gardens were in outlying areas, brought their produce into town on Friday nights to sell door to door on the weekend. They stayed in cheap rented rooms or boarding houses in Howick and Durham Streets, the area which became known as Chinatown. One of the boarding house managers was to Ah Tuck. He married Susan Wells in Bathurst in 1866. On the marriage certificate, Ah Tuck listed his occupation as lodging house keeper. And we have Louise Wood and, and Patricia Hagney who are great granddaughters. Yeah, yeah. yeah tonight. Um, the 1867 directory also listed Sun Kong Fat and Sun Kong Song as boarding houses in Rankin Street and Howard Street. Chinese stores, which were key to the organisation of this commerce, did much more than sell goods. They served the interests of members of the same clan, organising travel, sending remittances, arranging funerals, exhumations and repatriations of those who died in Australia. This advertisement was placed by Kung Lung, Chinese storekeeper, Howick Street, Bathurst. Um, it's an advertisement for a, a, um, um, a horse that's gone missing. Um, it's claimed that Kung Lung, <coughs> who was from Kungkwon County, was the founder of the Chinese Masonic Society of Australia. Another store was Sun Kum Young. The rate registers from 1875, which are in the um, museum upstairs, show that Sun Kum Young was in Rankin Street in a building leased from Dr. Dunn. Sun Kum Young was a branch store of Sun Kum Thai in Sydney. Sun Kum, Kum Thai store served the interests of clan members from the Hurm San district, which was later renamed Jung San. Records of business licenses at State Archives New South Wales that show that from 1867, Chinese stores in Bathurst began acquiring um, hawkers licenses. In 1867, Sun Kuang Fong applied for a hawkers license to travel with a pack horse. In 1870, Ah Chong of Kong Wong store in Bathurst was issued with a license to hawk on foot. These early market gardeners and hawkers provided a vital service for the residents of Bathurst. In 1876, there was a severe drought in the Western Districts. The editor of the short-lived Bathurst newspaper, the Western Independent, wrote about how Chinese market gardeners and hawkers had spared Bathurst residents 
from the worst of the drought. Uh, this is part of it here. As far as Bathurst itself is concerned, no great inconvenience is felt or cause of complaint heard. And it is marvelous how they persistently bring around their daily supplies of green vegetables, showing what perseverance and energy can always accomplish under the most unfavorable of circumstances. So in the time before irrigation, refrigeration, mechanization and rail, Bathurst Chinese market gardeners played a crucial role in growing and delivering fresh vegetables to the residents of Bathurst and district. And from the earliest days, Chinese residents of Bathurst were generous supporters of the hospital. The names of Chinese subscribers to the hospital are amongst those in the first list of subscribers published in the Western Independent in 1878. Donations to the hospital continued up to the late 1930s. You're falling asleep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. When rail reached Bathurst in 1876, enabling access to the Sydney market, there was prolifer proliferation of new gardens and Bathurst became a center of Chinese market gardening. French traveler Edmond Marin Le Malay, who traveled from Sydney to Dubbo in 1883, recorded his observations in this book, The New Australia. He wrote, the Chinese who are the best gardens in Australia grow all sorts of fruit and vegetables and perform horticultural miracles along the banks of the Macquarie. Today, on the outskirts of every Australian town, great or small, one comes across these beings who look as though they were suffering from chronic jaundice. They are our vegetable purveyors, and without them, these delicious necessities for European tables would be beyond the reach of most people. La Melee also commented on wheat farms. In the 1880s, when wheat and other grains were grown in Bathurst, Chinese were an important labor source for harvesting. In 1882, the Bathurst Free Press commented, were it not for the much maligned Chinaman, a large quantity of the wheat crop would be lost by being overripe before gathering. So um, I'd like to make the point that Chinese market gardens were not, were not only left over from the gold rushes. There were Chinese market gardens in Bathurst from at least 1870 um, to at least 1950. And long after the gold rushes had ended, Chinese continued to come to Bathurst from China and elsewhere in Australia to work as market gardeners. So now I'm going to introduce some of the cast. Um, well, that's a marriage certificate anyway. Um, one of the earliest market garden families in Bathurst was the family of James R. Lin and Joanna Nutter. As I mentioned earlier, the 1867 directory listed <coughs> R. Lin, market gardener at Lagoon. James Lynn married Joanna Nutter in Bathurst in 1870. They both died in Bathurst and they're buried in Bathurst Cemetery. I made contact with Ray Dwyer, the great grandson of James and Joanna R. Lynn. His aunt was Bathurst resident Jill Britton. People know Jill? Many people know Jill. Is she, is she still alive? No. No. She's over heaven. <laughs> well, she did pass down the family story that Jimmy and Joey R. Lynn were hard workers. Each week they would load a dray so full of produce for sale she needed to walk it to the Bathurst market, but she always had a ride back. And if you ever seen some of those really, like those drays like totally loaded up with cauliflowers, you can imagine. Some people in the audience, and I know David Bullock is one of them, may remember Joanna, um, James and Joanna Lynn's grandson, Herbert Lynn, born in 1876. Herb's pictured here in his garden. Um, Herb's grandson, Ray, recalls that his grandfather had a market garden on the Kelso side of the Vale Creek, where he grew tomatoes, beans, peas, cucumbers, to tobacco and watermelons. Herb used 44 gallon drums mixed with, filled with liquid manure to fertilize his vegetables and a horse and plow. The gardeners dug pump holes in dry times and sometimes Ray would take a dip in them. A Chinese gardener called Yuk, who had a garden next to Herb, um, would chase Ray, who was afraid of him. The gardens were close to Sharman's fruit shop. The Sharas, who ran the, the country fruit store for generations, used to buy vegetables from Herb. Another early market gardening family in Bathurst was the Luff family. Um, this is the gravestone of Samuel Luff, who died in 1919 and is buried in Bathurst Cemetery. Um, there's a 
couple of people who will read Chinese in the audience and they'll see that his name was actually Wong, not Luck. Luck was a name acquired. Wong, What's yeah. the village? Wong. What village? Hong Kong. Hong Kong is, uh, could be a mixed surname. Yeah. Well, as you I see, you probably could, done, um, could be the Fong, Fong village. The, um, <coughs> the Chinese character is really important in telling you where the village is from. So a lot of gravestones just have the English on them, but when they've got the Chinese, you can learn so much more. Um, Sun Sun so means just yeah, Wong is a family name. Yep. Sun means three. Luck could have been just the principle that he's the life. principle, the strength in life that the father wants the son to stand up to. Okay. Whatever, yes. whatever well, it is. Okay. Great. Yeah. But his, name was, his name was actually Samuel, but it was called Sam. So he was born in Tuina in 1869 to Hannah Sabra and an unnamed father. In 1886, Hannah <coughs> married 42-year-old John Luff, gardener from Canton, and moved with their family to Bathurst. Sam, like his father John Luff, became a market gardener. Another of the sons of John Luff and Hannah Sabra was Louis Luff, um, who worked for the Western Stores and was the bandmaster of the City Model Band. He's holding the baton in the centre of this photo. You might have seen it before because this photo comes from, um, well, I'll keep it a secret for a little bit longer. Um, Louis' son, Hector Luff, was a well-loved piano tuner in Bathurst, who some of you will remember. This photo was taken at Burrenjuk Dam in 1956 with his young son, Graham. Looking a bit older here, Graham Luff. Dr. Graham Luff, artist and architectural historian. Graham's great uncle was market gardener Sam Luff. Um, Graham still tends to Sam Luff's grave in Bathurst Cemetery. Another well-known family are the Yows. Um, gold mining registers of Pisapala list the name Yao, so it's likely that Yao's were on the gold fields before they became market gardeners. Charles I. R. Yao, whose gravestone you see here, married Mary Muksung in Wilerawang in 1907. Their children were Charles, Cecil, Reginald and Arthur. Charles Yao died in Bathurst in 1927. His gravestone is one of the few Chinese gravestones remaining in the Bathurst Cemetery. Uh, there are some who may remember Charles Yao Jr. who worked at the post office and had a distinguished World War II record. That's Dawn and Yvonne's father. <laughs> Others may remember his brother Reg. This is an early photo of Reg. You probably don't recognise him here. Reg had 11 acres of land on, on Edgell's Lane in Kelso on which he grew pumpkins and other vegetables and grasses which he supplied for the Western district exhibit at the Royal Easter Show. He might look more familiar in this photo from 1952 from a story from the Australian Woman's Weekly. Reg is pictured with his prize pumpkins, which he contributed to the Western District exhibits. Also in the photo is Dawn. Um, according to Dawn, Reg grew white asparagus for edgels and sold surplus out of a Bedford truck at the Haymarket. Both Reg and Dawn's father, Charles Yao, were in high demand as pruners. A market gardening family who moved to Bathurst in the 20th century were Debbie Cannon Clark's great grandparents Charlie and Lucy on one. In this photo Charlie and Lucy are, are seated. Standing behind them are Richard, William and David. And David was the grandfather of Debbie. <clears throat> Rosanna's on the left, Dolly's on the right. This photo was taken at White Rock around the 1910s. So Charlie on Wan um, later changed their name to Owen. Real name was Law on Ming. Sorry, don't know how to pronounce it properly. Um, was born in Jungsen County in 1843. He arrived in New South Wales in 1860 and married Australian-born Lucy Arkin in Braywood. Um, when Charlie applied for naturalisation in 18, 1885, he was a merchant in Campbell Street. So really, right at the beginnings of Chinatown, Sydney. Family lived in Hillis Creek and Wagga. And Charlie made visits to Bathurst for at least a decade before the family moved here in 1912, around 1912. Because uh, this sign, uh, this advertisement I found in the newspaper shows he was likely here in 1912. Well, yeah, I think he was. Uh, Charlie Owen of Woodlands at Lagoon advertised for a team to plow 24 acres of black soil on the Campbell's River. 
1920, a tender was advertised for 75 acres of land on the Macquarie River at White Rock. The land suitable for tobacco and cauliflower growing was then occupied by Charlie Owen and Son. And the son that really worked with, um, with Charlie was William. Um, so in the Baptist Show records, I see quite a, quite a few references to William Owen um, winning prizes. Another market gardener who came to Bathurst in the 20th century was George Chu Ming. He was born in Canton in 1880 and arrived in Sydney in 1904. He was in Bathurst by 1921 when he won the Bathurst Cycling Club Cycling Trophy. Um, besides being a, a market gardener, George Chu Ming was, for the most of the 1920s, 30s and 40s, the president of the Chinese Masonic Lodge on the corner of Durham and Rankin Streets. That's where um, Brabham's is now. George married Dubbo-born Ruby Wing in 1922. The same year, Ruby's the same year Ruby's sister Eva married Hung Sing, a storekeeper in East Orange, who also had a market garden in Cheeseman's Creek in Molong. Many of you will know of the Hung Sing restaurant in Blaney. Mm -hmm. George and Ruby lived in the red brick house on Durham Street, closest to the Chinese Masonic Lodge. It's still it's still there. A few years after Ruby died in 1941, George sold up and went to work at Hung Sing's garden at Cheeseman's Creek. Bill Wolfler, who had just returned from the war, bought the house. Uh, this is George Chu Ming with Bill's son, Tony Wolfler. Tony shared this photo with me. This is Yet Mong. He looks ancient in these photos. He was 50 when he arrived in Bathurst in 1912. This photo was taken 20, 20 years later in 1930. <laughs> Yet Mong was from Dungun. Um, he had come to New South Wales in 1884, leaving a pregnant wife in China. He worked as a French polisher in Sydney for 26 years before he took a visit back to China in 1910, when his second son was conceived. After returning to Australia in 1912, he began working as a market gardener in Bathurst on land leased from the Barnes Brothers. Starting out as a market gardener at the age of 50 would have been really physically taxing for a, someone who was not a market gardener but a, a French polisher. So maybe that's why he looks so old. Uh, yet Mong worked with another market gardener named George Su Won. Ray Bayless, um, Chris Bayless's uncle, who was born in Bathurst in 1908, remembered George Su Won and Yet Mong from his childhood on the Vale Creek. He recalled in an interview. Uh, the main farming activity was growing corn, and some of the flats were covered with lucerne, and others had cauliflowers. There were quite a lot of cauliflowers growing on the, the flats along the Bow Creek, and some of the land was leased by the Chinese. I remember our property, part of the flats being leased to Su Wong and Yet Nong. I think that's Yet Nong. They were two Chinese tenants there who grew cauliflowers on those flats, and when they came to pay their rent each month, they brought along a jar of Chinese ginger, which was very much appreciated by the kids. Chinese market gardeners in Bathurst were mobile, well, not just in Bathurst, everywhere, and they maintained strong ties with Chinese businesses in the hay market and across Australia and the Pacific, as well as their villages in China. Um, in this picture, you see George Ding on the left. Um, before moving to Bathurst, George was head man for Tai Sang's banana chambers in the hay market. So they used to have these sweating rooms um, to ripen the bananas. Um, and George um, worked for, um, for Tai Sang doing that. He also worked for Tai Sang in the Pacific Islands. Sitting with George is Lydia Castle, with whom George had a family in Bathurst. Lydia had previously married James Mo Xing, with whom she had a daughter, Queenie, who's sitting between George and Lydia. So is Lorraine, Lorraine Stevens is not here today, right? Because Lorraine Stevens is somebody else. She lives in Bathurst and, and she is um, Queenie's granddaughter. In 1912, George moved to Bathurst and opened a fruit and veg store in Rankin Street. By 1924, he was working as a labourer in On War's garden at Esrum. There were also a few Chinese Aboriginal families in Bathurst. Perhaps the first uh, Chinese Aboriginal marriage in the wider district took, part in, took place in 1878 when James Kon Su, born Hong Kong around 1838, married Lucy Barber, um, born in 1857 on the Bogan River. Uh, they married in Karkor, where James worked as a butcher, shepherd, gardener, and labourer, and where nine children were born to the couple. One of these was Bessie Konsu, 
who married James Walter at All Saints Cathedral in Bathurst in 1904. This was their marriage certificate. By the time Bessie married, her father, James, had died. His occupation is listed on the marriage certificate as gardener. Um, another family was Edward R.C. and Harriet Howard. Um, both of them were born around 1846. Harriet was born in Bathurst, and Edward and Annie are considered the progenitors of the, the, um, the Aboriginal R.C. families of the, of the Central West. Um, right, so where were these market gardens? Everyone traveling okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so going back to 1875, the Bathurst District Historical Society Museum has the rate registers for the Bathurst municipality from 1875. These list the names of owners and, and occupants of houses and land. Amongst nine Chinese leasing houses and land on Morrison Street in 1875 was Sam Singh, who was leasing a house, a house and land from Mrs. Dargan. Rate books for um, Rate books show that by 1881, Sam Singh had extended his leases of land um, to Hope and Mitre Streets, and he continued leasing until 1889 when he advertised that he was moving his party of 14 men to Mrs. Dargan's land at Kelso. Um, in 1891, the rate books show that the Morrison Street Gardens extended from Peel Street to Packer Streets. Unfortunately, the, the rate registers more or less stopped there because um, the rate registers are only for the Bathurst municipality and um, the rate, regist rate books for Turon and Abercrombie Shires have been lost. So we don't know the lot numbers of gardens beyond the Bathurst municipality, who was leasing to whom. Um, but there are other sources which show where these gardens were. In 1889, Sam Lupp's mother, Hannah, wrote a letter to the Minister of Public Education stating, I am unable to pay my school fees as my husband is unable to work and I have seven children to keep. Um, the district inspector wrote in notes, Mr. John Lupp is a Chinese and is supported by his countrymen at the gardens, being unable to work himself on account of his delicate state of health. He recommended that Mrs. Lupp be relieved of payment of fees until the end of the year. Also on file is a letter of support from Emily Suttor, the wife of F.B. Suttor. Um, you see the letter here which stated that she considered Mrs. Lupp to be a very hard-working, industrious woman who has to support herself and five children, having no assistance but the little of the, that the boys can sometimes earn. Mrs. Suttor addressed her letter from Bradwardine, so it's likely that the gardens John worked at were the market gardens on Bradwardine, then owned by the Suttor family. So using newspaper reports, um, I charted the, the Chinese market gardens on this map, um, you probably can't read it, but I'll tell you um, some of the, na the names of properties along the Macquarie and its tributaries, such as Bradwardine, Hereford, Alloway Bank, um, Orton Park, and the web properties Hathrock and L Littlebourne. In 1905, the National Advocate published a lift-out supplement on Bathurst, which included photos of John Joseph Sullivan's irrigation farm at Alloway Bank. The report stated, J.J. Sullivan has at the present time 50 acres of potatoes, some acres of cabbages and onions, the latter under the care of some Chinese gardeners, it being impossible to, to induce white gardeners to undertake the drudgery entailed in the cultivation of this necessary commodity. Uh, unfortunately, um, it's, it's pretty hard to see the, you can see a channel there, you can sort of, uh, this is actually the photo of the onions, so unfortunately it's not clear. Um, there were also a small number of Chinese landowners, which are revealed in this report. Um, a survey, an 1885 survey of land and stockholders in New South Wales. It lists four land and stockholders in Bathurst with Chinese names. One was Tommy R.C., who had two horses, and 1,500 sheep on 1,260 acres at Malmesbury, Dunkeld. James R. Lum, who I think is James R. Lynn, had 18 acres and five horses at Campbell's River Lagoon. Also on the Campbell's River, on 16 acres with two horses, was R. Lynn's brother-in-law, R. Key, who married Joanna's sister. The other landholder was Lum Key. He had six horses and five head of cattle on 35 acres at Kellershiel. By 1891, Lum Key had 120 head of cattle. 
Together with the 640 acres he was leasing from W.B. Rankin, his holdings totaled 1,000 acres. He described himself as an Eglinton farmer and was given the moniker of the Chinese squatter of Duramana. Um, he married a woman born in China named R. Holt and he brought her to live at Duramana. She died shortly after arriving, probably, giving, probably after giving birth to a child. She is the only Chinese born woman in Bathurst that I found in my research. But these <coughs> land and stockholders were in the minority. The majority of Chinese leased or subleased land. Um, one of these was uh, Sun Sing, who leased land from William Ingersoll near Stevens Lane on the Kelso side of the Macquarie River. It's very rare to find, re to find <coughs> leases like this. Uh, the previous owners of River, House on, um, of River House on the Macquarie River showed me this lease and I knocked on the door of River House and, um, and uh, the owner who's been there for 18 months now said that he's still got the lease, which is great. In 1888, Sun Sing signed a 10-year agreement with William Ingersoll to lease approximately five acres of land. Sun Sing agreed to pay what I think is the exor exorbitant fee of 40 pounds per year for five acres in equal half yearly installments. Uh, there were actually, there's actually like three pages of this really dense legalese um, in which it says that if Sun Sing defaulted on payment, the lease would be forfeited. So I don't know how he went, but his name does appear, Sun Sing's name does appear in this of awards given out for the O'Connell and Macquarie Plains, Macquarie Plains Campbell and Fish River Agricultural Association, which is the forerunner of the Bathurst show. In 1890, Sun Sing took out first prize for carrots, pumpkins, and turnips. Another prize winner was Yet Sing, whose portrait is in the A.E. Gregory collection. Yet Sing was a regular winner in the Bathurst show from 1891 until at least 1906. Um, lists of produce sales in the newspaper show that he was growing potatoes in Kelso. His name disappeared from Bathurst newspapers around 1913, which might mean that he, he um, moved elsewhere or returned to China. Um, now, the size of the gardens is highlighted in this 1886 news story of flooding. Um, when Ah Min's garden at Stony Creek near the garden near the junction of Campbell's River was flooded, 9,000 of his cabbages were taken clean away. Um, by the 1890s, Chinese market gardens were no longer simply supplying the local market, they're growing on a commercial scale and sending produce by rail to the Sydney produce markets. A news article from 1893 reported two wagons, one drawn by 12 and the other by 18 bullocks. What a sight that would have been, <laughs> transporting six tons of cauliflowers grown by Chinese at Lagoon, Stony Creek and Campbell's River to Perth railway station for transport to the Sydney market. In 1912, it was reported that 10 acres of Chinese gardens in Morrisett Street produced 200 tons of vegetables. A harvest of 300 tons was expected in 1913, <coughs> owing to a good season. Um, um, I can tell you more things, there's more, many more reports like that. The Bathurst Times stated hundreds of tonnes of vegetables were sent to, to Sydney from the Chinaman's Gardens at Kelso and Bathurst, and life weights from Eglinton, Kellershiel, Rutherford's Flats, which was Hereford, and White Rock. Um, and to really get an idea of how extensive these gardens became, consider this description of the gardens in 1914. This report was written, by, um, was written by Inspector Gabriel of the External Affairs Department to Atlee Hunt, the Secretary of External Affairs. After he and Constable Lennon from the Bathurst Police raided Chinese gardens in Bathurst in search of illegal immigrants, he wrote, the number of Chinese employed on the Campbell's River, both sides, is very large. A few old men appear to be working at these gardens in conjunction with a number of young and middle-aged Chinese. The police of the district are of the opinion that the younger Chinese never come into the township, always remaining at the gardens. These gardens, extending some 12 or 14 miles on one side of Bathurst to, to three and a half miles on the other side of Bathurst, grow principally tobacco and cauliflowers. So uh, I did ask Jeff McSpedden to come here tonight because he's been promising, promising me a picture of cauliflowers from around there for a long time, but I still haven't got it. Um, so here's another um, excerpt 
Well, I'm going to read another excerpt from Walter Hunt's Recollections, which I'm pairing with this photo from the Victorian State Library. It's one of the very few photos of Chinese market gardens that I've been able to locate. Chinese market gardens in Bathurst, that is. This is actually a tobacco plantation. Um, Hunt wrote, so all along the river flats at various intervals were to be seen Chinese huts, either on the river banks or adjacent to their work areas. These huts generally consisted of a big room with open fireplace and a bedroom. The timber was cut from the bush and the roof thatched with straw. Each house would house three or four Chinamen. In addition to their living huts were tobacco sheds for drying the leaf when harvested, prior to, when harvested prior to pressing into bales approximately 400 weight for market. Sheds were also made of timber with open sides and thatched roofs, about 150 feet long by 30 feet wide and 15 feet high to allow the air to get through the drying leaf. So you can really see it, can't you? It's a pretty you know, perfect description of what you see there. Um, and this is the same site today. Anyone recognize where it is? Yes, it's Mount Pleasant right next to Abercrombie House. Um, and there are reports of wells on properties. In 1917, the local land board, uh, is that the, um, yeah, that's right. Um, in 1917, the local land board sought to acquire property for um, soldier settlement blocks. So they approached Jay McPhillamy's um, Mount Tamar and White Rock properties, or rather, they approached Jay, Jay McPhillamy to sell his Mount Tamar and White Rock properties. McPhillamy did not want to sell, so a land board inquiry was held in Bathurst. At the inquiry, it was said that the land contained three Chinamen's huts and nine wells. Henry Bell gave evidence at the inquiry that he leased 329 acres of Mount Tamar from McPhillamy, of which he sublet about 10 acres of the flats to Chinese gardeners. As a whole, the land was valued at um, 11 pounds 15 per acre, but the flats were valued at 37 pounds 10. Per acre. So leasing and subleasing was a profitable venture which not only earned high rent but also ensured improvement of the land. One landowner who had a successful arrangement with Chinese gardeners was Herbert Gunning, who leased some blocks on his 242 acres of land at White Rock to Chinese gardeners. I visited Lorna and Keith Gunning in 2015. Anyone know Lorna and Keith? Yes. 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 Are they still going? Yes. Yes. That's great. He showed me Herbert Gunning's drawing account from 1921. Herbert was his grandfather. It shows that R. Wei, Harry Chinaman, R. So and R. Gunn were leasing land from Herbert Gunning in 1921. It was also reported in the newspaper um, that in 1922, Herbert Gunning's team of six horses was hauling six and a half ton of, of pumpkin grown by Chinaman for delivery in Durham Street. Chinese had grown 30 tons of pumpkins on Gunning's property, while Gunning grew 40 tons worth. So back to Walter Hunt. Um, he goes on to say, as more and more of the Chinese made enough money to go home to China, the landholders began to realize there was more money to be made growing the produce than in renting the ground. For a time, the share system came in, whereby the Chinamen grew the produce on the share. Then gradually the white men took over. Horse-drawn scarifiers got over the ground quicker than the man with the hoe. Pumps on the river took the place of the wells. Um, so this isn't quite accurate because um, it posits that Chinese market gardeners could not adapt to um, machinery and new technology. And that wasn't the case. In fact, they can be seen to have been early adapters of technology if it suited purpose and if they had access to capital. It was rather the case that the market gardeners faced a number of obstacles to their success, which I'll go on to talk about. Um, notwithstanding this, share farming led to mutual prosperity. In 1917, the Advocate reported many tons of cauliflowers are being sent um, daily from Bathurst, Perth, Bill George's Plains and Kelso Railway Station. Chinamen are the growers, some on their own, others on the halve systems with those who own the land. Now the halve system, um, I prefer to call it the share system because it wasn't always halves. Under the share system, land, implements, and materials were provided by the landholder and labor by the Chinese gardener. The profits to be shared on, a, on a, an agreed basis and the risk in most cases to be the burden of the Chinese party. This offered many advantages for the landowner who received retu um, high returns for little outlay. 
had the land improved and learned from the Chinese market gardeners. One of these landowners was Robert Gordon Edgell, who moved to Bathurst in 1902, purchased Bradwardine, um, and purchased Bradwardine from F.B. Sutter in 1906. From 1911 or earlier, Edgell leased land on the share system to Chinese market gardeners. Um, uh, in this article, it describes how Edgell got water, oh, he was cultivating his, his land using Chinese methods. In this article, it describes how he got water from wells dug close to the bed of the river, flood irrigated the land and graded his paddocks level, being careful to an exact inch. In this manner, he could obtain multiple crops in the year. Edgell also attempted to emulate Chinese gardeners' liberal manuring of the soil. In 1921, he offered to buy street sweepings from the council for the horse manure. Um, in 1932, an on-site auction sale of market garden plant and building material at Bradwardine was advertised. It belonged to market gardener On War, a prominent Chinese mason who had been in Bathurst since at least 1918. On War's equipment included an engine and centrifugal pump, three harrows, three scarifiers, spring cart and harness. The sale gives no clue as to whether the lease had expired or whether On War had the, had the option to renew it. However, the 300 sheets of galvanized iron that were part of the sale suggest that the shed and living quarters were dismantled. There's no record of on war in Bathurst after this time, and I think that was the last of the Chinese market gardeners on um, Edgell's Bradwardine. Edgell's canneries, of course, went on to be one of Bathurst's great success stories, but the Chinese gardeners who built the foundation of Edgell's productive lands are missing from biographical accounts. The extensive gardens I've been telling you about have disappeared from the Bathurst landscape. Actually, Nan Hunt did tell me that when she used to walk from Lee Street on either side um, of, uh, of the highway, then she could see gardens. And you can see in this picture here, can you see the bridge cross crossing the Macquarie, the Denison Bridge there? Yep. And, uh, and you can see the market gardens there quite clearly. And the, I tried to get the same picture there, and that's where the hockey fields and Lee Mont Park are now. <clears throat> um, so, why did they disappear? Um, I want to talk a little about that. First, there were the physical challenges. Um, the market gardeners battled with the vicissitudes of flood, frost, and drought in Bathurst. Um, a late frost in December 1892 ruined crops of Chinese gardeners who had only just pulled themselves together after floods in September. Whilst Chinese gardens were washed away at Ezrum in February 1895 and Kelso in February 1896, by February, February 1897, Bathurst entered the Federation drought, and Chinese on the river flats had only half, uh, who had only half their regular water supply dug trenches in the sand. Out of um, those physical challenges, droughts, frosts and floods, floods seem to have been the most devastating um, for, for Bathurst Chinese market gardeners. You have to remember that, that Chipley Dam had not yet been built and the council hadn't erected the levee banks. Um, so over the years, there were numerous accounts of floods inundating Chinese gardens and ruining their crops, um, with floods sometimes occurring more than once a year. Uh, in particular, the 1952 flood was, was devastating. But there were also human-created obstacles placed in the way of the success of the market gardeners. One of the biggest challenges facing Chinese market gardeners was racially discriminatory legislation. Historian Kate Bagnall wrote, the Immigration Restriction Act of 1901 was designed to limit non-European and other so-called undesirable migration to Australia. It introduced a dictation or education test which could be used to exclude those seeking to enter Australia by requiring them to pass a written test in a language they did not necessarily understand. Initially, the test was to be in English, but a later amended, amendment in 1905 changed this to being in any prescribed language. Um, so this was a test that was intended to exclude colored immigrants. In his book on the dictation test, historian Michael Williams has given examples of this test being given in Estonian and Gaelic. Um, so Chinese already resident in Australia could apply for a certificate of exemption from the dictation test, I'll call that a CEDT, which allowed them to leave Australia and re-enter. 
So Sam Lup and co uh, accompanied his elderly father back to China. Um, though born in Australia, Sam Lup had to apply for a CUBT, which you see there. Um, so the Immigration Restriction Act prohibited men from bringing their wives and families to Australia if they wanted to do so. So it really stifled family lives. <clears throat> Um, this is a page from the CEDT of Bathurst Market Gardener, Ding Pang, who applied for a certificate of exemption in 1924. Certificates required front and profile photos, um, the hated fingerprinting, and also references. Ding Pang's file contained a reference from one of the Mockler brothers, who attested that he had known Ding Pang for 16 years as a market gardener. Ding Pang had his photos for the CEDT taken at the A. Gregory Photographic Studio in George Street. Um, this photo is actually in the, the, um, the A.E. Gregory collection um, at Bathurst District Historical Society, but it's mistakenly labelled as Art Poodle. It's Ding Pang. Um, another um, discriminatory legislation was the Old Age and Invalid Pensions Act of 1908, which disqualified Aboriginal natives of Australia, <coughs> um, natives of Africa, the Pacific Islands, New Zealand and Asiatics from receiving a pension unless born in Australia. Um, and also Commonwealth legislation prevented Chinese people from being naturalised. Um, land could only be purchased by naturalised British subjects. In 1884, R2 of Bathurst applied for naturalisation. He had arrived in 1860. His reason for application was that he uh, desires to purchase land and enjoy privileges under the Act. <clears throat> uh, however, um, the New South Wales government ceased granting naturalisations to Chinese people in 1887, and the Commonwealth Naturalisation Act of 1903 excluded Chinese and other natives of Australia, Asia, uh, Africa, and the Pacific from naturalisation. And it remained the Australian government, government's policy not to grant applications for naturalisation by Chinese. It was not until 1957 that long resident Chinese were finally able to apply for citizenship. Um, and as few Chinese market gardens were naturalised, uh, the, the tenure of they, the land that they leased was insecure. Uh, a really important case um, that shows this was uh, a case which came to the Bathurst District Court and ended up in the Supreme Court in 1913. Um, so uh, P.S. McPhillamy had been leasing 90 acres of land to John Honeyman, who in turn <coughs> leased that land to at least 12 acres of that land to R. Mo. During the lease, I hope you're going to follow this. During the lease, the land was sold. So um, P.S. McPhillamy sells the land to Edward Beswick. So Honeyman gave up possession. R. Mo asked, asked the new owner, Beswick, if he could lease the land. But he's, been, but he's told that it was already leased to the, the Barnes brothers and he was given a fortnight in which to remove his equipment and vegetables. So Armo sued Edward Beswick for having entered and broken into his gardens at White Rock and depastured the land with his cattle, destroying the vegetables and benefits which would have accrued to him. Edward Beswick gave evidence that there was practically nothing of value in the land when it was ploughed over by Barnes. This was contradicted by Honeyman who had seen a lot of wood cabbages and peas and cucumbers that were rather good when he visited Armo's garden. The verdict found in Armo's favour. However, he was awarded only 10 pounds of the 600 pounds in damage he had claimed, and the judge refused to grant costs. So you see, without security of tenure, the, the physical and capital investment that Chinese gardeners put into cultivating the land for their crops was at real risk of ending suddenly. Um, there was also harassment by the council's inspector of nuisances and by police. Um, harassment for um, their um, uh, collections of manure and so on that they used to, to um, fertilise the garden. And then um, after the, the Gaming and Bedding Act was introduced in 1906, police conducted constant raids. Um, on Chinese premises suspected of being used as gaming houses. They were charged, often convicted, and made to pay hefty fines or face imprisonment. In 1906, this row of four adjoining cottages at 96 to 102 Durham Street, still standing, which is great, 
was leased by Ah Gao, Tong Sing, Ah Song, and Tong Yang Kim. That year, police raided the cottage at 102 um, Durham Street and charged 20 Chinese men with being in a common gaming house without lawful excuse, and charged Ah Gao with being the keeper of the gaming house. There were many other such raids. In a number of cases, magistrates expressed regret for having to sentence Chinese for having to sentence Chinese for gambling. When passing sentence of a £10 fine on Ah Sing in 1915, the police magistrate was reported as lamenting, it was a pity these poor fellows should be harassed. He had noticed through many years that, that though the Gaming Act had been instituted for Chinese and Europeans alike, that the Chinese suffered from an overwhelming, suffered from an overwhelming proportion from its provisions. This appeared unfortunate as these people were restricted in their field of recreation. There were also raids on houses where opium was smoked. Um, up until 1905, the sale and use of opium was legal. It was actually um, Chinese merchants such as Kuang Tart who campaigned um, against opium and eventually had it prohibited. However, there were no rehabilitation programs to assist addicts, most of whom were Chinese. So the importation, distribution, and use of opium was then carried on as an illegal activity. And in Bathurst, there were frequent raids on Chinese gathering places between 1909 and 1933, which netted opium users who had to pay heavy fines or serve jail sentences. Um, so for example, in 1909, our guy, a 45-year-old gardener at Lagoon, received a fine of 50 pounds for being the lessee of the house at 267. Howard Street being used for the purpose of smoking opium. Um, in 1932, 63 year old Ah Singh was named as the lessee of the, of the Chinese Masonic Society at 108 Durham Street and fined 30 pounds for knowingly committing the, the premises to be used for opium smoking and having a quantity of prepared opium in his possession. Um, so, actually, most of the, um, um, the market gardens didn't speak English or didn't speak it very well. So uh, this man, John Pugh, born in Narandera, um, who moved to Bathurst in 1920, um, was, uh, the interpret was an interpreter at that time. Um, and he was spoken of very highly. Um, Mr. Pugh has carried out a considerable amount of good work in Bathurst in the interests of Chinese, um, so and so. He's always accorded the utmost confidence in the law courts where his services as interpreter are often required. Um, I, I thought maybe his two um, great, I think granddaughters might have come tonight, but they're not here. I've made contact with them and they shared this photo. John also worked as a labourer employed by Abercrombie, Abercrombie Council building roads. He's said to have worked on the Mount Panorama Road. He died at the age of 61 while working on the Barthampton Road. Um, then there were efforts to obstruct relationships between Chinese men and European women. The media of the day portrayed Chinese men as a threat to European women, and relationships between Chinese men and European women were not only ridiculed but obstructed by police. While some of the women harassed by police were undoubtedly prostitutes, others were in genuine relationships. I could go on, but I'll cut that short and you can read my thesis instead. Um, so, in so the Bathurst Free Press and Mining Bathurst Free Press and Mining Journal and the National Advocate might have represent had different rep, represented different things. One represented free trade and the other protectionism, but they were united in their anti-Chinese views. Um, actually, the Bathurst Free Press was really the worst. But the National Advocate in 1892 adopted the masthead Australia for Australians, and these attitudes filtered into social attitudes, name calling, stone throwing. Pilfering of produce were everyday occurrences. Stealing a melon seems to have been something of a rite of passage for young Bathurst boys. David Day's biography of Ben Shipley, um, born in 1885, recounts a, a family anecdote of a run-in between young Ben and his brothers and Chinese market gardeners on the Kelso River Flats. Um, this is from the biography. The Chinese market gardeners chased the three brothers, firing revolvers in the air for pinching a watermelon. Ben escaped over the railway bridge, Pat swam the Macquarie River, and Dick made his way home along the highway. As punishment, they had to say the rosary all that afternoon and keep an eye out for the Chinamen. <laughs> Max Churches told me a similar story about stealing melons from a Chinese garden at Kelso in the 1940s when he was about nine or 10 years old. 
He said, the biggest thing I can remember about them is that the bottom end of the market garden used to go down into Raglan Creek, which we used to go down into, three or four of us, and come up when the watermelons were ripe and used to go and try and get some to eat. And of course the Chinese gentlemen would see us and they'd come racing across at us with their big knives and things. We should have known that if we asked them, they would have given us a truckload if we wanted them. <laughs> um, but some pranksters were still stealing vegetables and assaulting um, Chinese market gardeners as adults. In September 1920, market gardener Hop Singh had just loaded his cauliflowers into a van at Rawongul railway station when he saw three men taking cauliflowers from the van and putting them in a cart. When Hop Singh told the man with the cart to stop, the man hit him with a whip, breaking his collarbone. Um, George William Gunning, railway night officer at Burrawongal Station, was convicted of assault and given a two-month suspended sentence, uh, which was overturned on appeal. Um, and uh, there are other such uh, um, newspaper articles describing assaults. Um, but in two separate uh, incidents in 1930 and 1939, assaults on Chinese market gardens in Bathurst ended up as murder cases. <clears throat> in spite of all this, the Chinese growers persevered through the first half of the 20th century and even tried new enterprises. In 1934, Jim Sherman, well-known auctioneer and market gardener on Russell Street, installed a, a banana sweating plant comprised of two rooms in a portion of his mart. <clears throat> he placed George Ding in, freight, in charge of the sweating operations. Um, so this is an older George Ding with his granddaughter Patricia. You might remember that's the younger George Ding. Um, so I don't know what happened with the banana sweating room, but George died in Bathurst in 1940. He's buried in the Church of England section in Bathurst Cemetery. Now by the late 1930s, the Chinese gardens in Bathurst had been reduced to Morrison Street in Kelso. Um, back in 2014, so almost 10 years ago, I spoke to Brian Bennett, who's also passed on. He told me that in 1938, when he was seven, he began living in Morrison Street when his father began market gardening there on three acres. Do you remember him? Yes. Yeah. Uh, he said virtually half Morrison Street length would have been gardens of some ownership and probably a good third would have been run by approximately seven Chinese gardeners and a couple of chaps that used to come from Sydney as overseers, I would assume. They worked the land with all sorts of vegetable, vegetables to be sold to the Sydney markets and locally. They had their little sugar bags over their back for carrying home and any other commodity like rice or the few things they bought and they walked past them mainly they seemed to wear shorts. They had pumps down on the river bank to bring water up into channels down the side of each, uh, what they call the land, which is a flat thing. <laughs> they worked up like a tabletop. That's how flat they were. They worked on flow. By the 1940s, Brian remembers the market gardens having a draft horse and a single furrow plough, which they left for Brian's father. Brian recalled Joe Sue. Well, he was the last chap I worked with down in the paddock there, pulling out weeds and that sort of thing, just helping him out because he was very stooped over. <coughs> this photograph um, of the residence of the Chinese Masonic Lodge was taken around 1947. Uh, you can see St. Stephen's in the background, the spire of St. Stephen's, or maybe, maybe I, I sort of trimmed it. I don't know if you can see it. Anyway, um, uh, so the photo was shared by Tony Bookler. I showed you a picture of young Tony before, um, whose family lived next door to the lodge. In the centre of, uh, of the back row is Tony's father, Bill Bookler. Um, Wong Yu stands on the right in front of Bill, and Ellen O'Rourke, um, who is Dawn's mother, Dawn and, and, and Dawn's mother, identified the very old man next to Wong Yu was Jimmy Jong, who worked in Reggie Yao's garden. In 1953, the Chinese Masonic Lodge was demolished. Um, I don't know what became of the gardens in the photo. This is all that remains of the Chinese Masonic Lodge. It's the shrine cabinet that belonged to the lodge. In my estimation, it is by far the most significant artifact relating to Bathurst Chinese history. It's currently at Bathurst Goldfields. The same year the lodge was demolished, Red Jia sold off his land and quit market gardening. So, drawing to a close, you might be pleased to hear. My thesis ended at this point, but I should have added that although the Chinese market gardens disappeared from Bathurst around 1953, this was also the year that the first Chinese restaurant opened in Bathurst. 
Um, so as the market guarding chapter was closing, a new chapter was opening. To protect themselves and their children from being the subject of discrimination, some families changed their names. The sons and daughters of R. Tuck and Susan Wells changed their names from Tuck to Quinn. This is May Tuck, whose married name was Chorley. She's the grandmother of Louise Wood and Patricia Hagman, who are here tonight. Over generations, the family's Chinese heritage was forgotten. Louise and Patricia only learned of their Chinese heritage about 20 years ago when their cousin was researching the family history. And this is Herbert Lin, uh, young Herbert Lin in his Irish regiment uniform. Herbert and his siblings thought of themselves as Australians. They changed the spelling of their name to Lin or Lin. Uh, L Y double N from R Lin A H L I N to Lin L Y double N E to anglicise it. Herbert's grandson Ray recalled, "When I was a boy, I used to swim in the river. If we found a hole that was up to your waist, it was as deep as the ocean. One of the best places to swim was the irrigation pump holes. I would regularly be chased out of the holes by the Chinese farmers on the other side of the river. I would go and complain to grandfather about the Chinese." not realising he was half Chinese. <laughs> Ray was unaware he had Chinese ancestry until he was told by Jill Britton in 2000. He told me, as soon as I found out, I thought, wow, I'll tell everyone now. <laughs> so um, I more or less reached the end of my presentation, but one of the messages that I really wanted to get across was that um, this is not just the history for um, people of Chinese background. This is very much our history. I hope that you can see that how interconnected it is with Bathurst history. And if you're a historian, if you're writing local history, I would ask you to look around and see if you can find the Chinese history that might underlie the history you're writing about as well. Um, to end on a very positive note, I'm pleased to tell you that I've been working with Tamsin McIntosh, who just sent her apologies. Um, Tamsin's the Senior Heritage Planner at Bathurst Regional Council and she is um, preparing two interpretive signs that will acknowledge Bathurst Chinese history. Uh, one will be um, opposite St Stephen's Church looking towards Chinatown and the other one will be in Ribbon Gang Lane. So thank you Tamsin. Thanks again to the Bathurst District Historical Society. Thank you to the descendants who came tonight. Um, thank you to my colleagues who came from Sydney. And thank you to everyone in the audience for coming and for your patience in sitting through my long talk. <laughs>